And um, the path that I took kind of coming out of UVA, I often describe as circuitous. And, you know, I'll, I'll share a little bit of sort of my own philosophy to approach these kinds of career questions and trajectories. I think that, you know, as I was going through school, I don't know if many of you relate to this experience, but I, I kind of felt like there were a lot of folks who had their 10 year or 15 year or 20 year plan kind of laid out ahead of them, whether that was pre-med, pre-law or something else where they sort of knew this is exactly where I plan to go. Um, and I just felt like I needed a different approach for my life. I didn't think I had enough life experience at the time to be able to say, you know, this is where I'm going to land for the rest of my career. And so I've sort of developed kind of a, a philosophy that, you know, I've allowed the experiences I've had to guide me to the next step and really learned a lot from those. So, you know, I think that you'll see that thread as I described the career path that I took from UVA all the way into where I am now as a strategy consultant at Kaiser Permanente. And um, I actually started off in the outdoor education world. You know, I had done, um, I had worked at summer camps growing up. I really liked that kind of work. I, I liked working with young people. And I also liked the kind of lifestyle that I found of, you know, when I was young and unattached, being able to just travel around the country. Um, and developed a lot of great people skills through the process. So I worked uh, for a summer camp, like I said, that I was assistant directing. That was my first sort of job right out of college. Uh, I was there in the summer, and then I sort of followed that lead into working for an outdoor ed company in California called Natural Set Large, and um, did that for a couple of seasons, went back and assisted directed back on the East Coast, and then was back on the West Coast again, I wanted a new challenge and I thought sort of how do I combine what I'm doing now with some of my background and I learned about wilderness therapy, which is a way of sort of bringing the psychology. Um, bringing some of that healthcare side and combining it with what I found I really loved doing, which was, you know, showing and being out with groups in in the, you know, in the outdoors and having a chance to help them kind of grow in a variety of ways, whether that was, you know, team building focused or their own recovery, you know, from addiction or other types of uh, mental health, you know, things that they were struggling with. You know, so I did that uh, work um, seasonally and traveled a lot around the country, seeing different parts of the, the country. And I really recommend, you know, when you're fresh out of school and you don't have a lot of attachments, if you have the ability to travel and experience things that might be harder to do when you're more settled down, it's a great time to do it. So I was really grateful for all the experiences and the connections I made. And through that time, eventually the sort of lifestyle uh, war on me and I wanted to live in a place that wasn't so remote and where I could have a real social community, you know, be able to date and um, just have a little bit more of a normal week schedule. I, I think at that time I was working eight days on, six days off, Wednesdays to Wednesdays in rural South Central Utah. Not the ideal for having a social life, you know, when you live in a town, a county that has more cows than people. So I, I'm sorry, there's some alert on my phone. So, <laughs> Colorado has a new mask law in place or something or mask mask guidance that they are just telling us about at a convenient moment. So anyways, I, um, you know, I had had a paid internship in Denver um, through the um, peer health education program in the, you know, university health system. And I had spent about eight weeks um, during a summer when I was in college in Denver, and I really liked that area. And I had kind of been secretly comparing it to a lot of places where I'd lived and decided to just move to Denver. And I kind of took that bold step. I luckily had a cousin who I was able to live with for about a month or two until I found my footing. But I ended up looking at jobs that involved that healthcare sort of side or the behavioral health side, but were a little bit more stable. And I took a job as the Dean of Students at a day treatment program. And so adolescent day treatment is kind of your, um, if you think about tiers of care in, in healthcare and specifically in behavioral health, residential is kind of your most acute and, um, or hospitalization. And the next step down is sort of day treatment where we operate like a school where they're there for you know, 30 hours a week, every five, you know, five days a week they're coming in. Um, that's the level where I was working. And the next level might be intensive outpatient or outpatient below that, just to kind of give you a sense. So pretty tough um, students, but it was a really great program. And it was a lot based around some of the things that, that I loved, you know, empowerment focused, student government. Um, I brought some of the experiential education work. I did a big project where I started a community garden next to the school and ended up being able to 
fundraise for it, um, applied for a lot of grants, um, you know, and through my time, I was with Aurora Mental Health Center for about eight years, and I was able to start to approach some different projects. So, you know, stepping a little bit beyond just sort of that direct care side. And as the Dean, I was always doing a combination of the care and the administration coordination, you know, a whole range of things for the school. But I started doing a little bit more project work on the side and found that I did like that. And ultimately, you know, learning again from the experiences I had there, I recognized that, you know, the, the skills that I had developed, I wanted to apply them to impact larger systems. I think I saw being able to do great work on, you know, an individual and family basis, but the the things that I saw about the way our systems were set up required larger approaches. And I thought, I want to try to help and address that. And so I spent a lot of time thinking, what's my, what's my next step? How do I go about kind of transitioning from maybe the front side of healthcare to a little bit more of that business side to be able to impact larger systems? You know, and for me, um, you know, I ended up settling on getting an MBA. And that was, you know, I think the right choice for me because I had had a lot of hands-on experience, a lot of people skills work, um, and I was very good in those spaces at working with people um, from a lot of different perspectives and being able to sort of move a group towards a shared agenda and help people grow through the process. But I didn't have that background that someone who maybe had even taken a couple of business classes in school or had worked in a job that was more on the business side would have. So for me, it kind of filled in the complementary skills and put the picture together where I had, I think, a pretty competitive package of the business you know, learning and the people skills that I was able to put together. I also found it really useful for the networking. And I would say, you know, definitely lean on um, your, you know, the, the student services that provide all of this help around networking. These sessions and other things that are provided are really useful for, for building those connections in the real world. So the networking piece was as valuable as the, as the skills that I learned. As a matter of fact, it was a, a connection through LinkedIn when I was sort of trying to find folks who worked in the healthcare consulting field who I could network with and kind of uh, work my way in. Um, it was a connection through, you know, school um, to someone who happened to be a strategy consultant and I connected with them and that, that showed me some new opportunities um, in the Colorado region. And, you know, just a little background on where I am now. Um, Kaiser Permanente, as you probably know, is a national healthcare organization. The health plan is a not-for-profit um, and it works closely with the medical group, which employs the doctors and, and, and together they provide the care. They tend to work in large metro areas. California is by far the biggest region, but Colorado has about 600,000 members um, in the Denver Boulder region. And actually what was very interesting is that I came into the work um, sort of in the middle of a financial crisis for the region. Um, and I don't need to get into all of the details, except that sort of uh, after a couple of years of losses, it was like, we need to turn this around or we might not be a region anymore. And so they had set up a transformation office, which was designed to kind of be an interdisciplinary group of people, very aligned with the strategic goals of the region that would kind of address these different um, things that we need to do to sort of turn turn it around financially. And I ended up starting as a contractor um, in uh, the transformation office. So that was kind of my foot in the door approach. You know, and a lot of the time those positions give you a chance to kind of get in there and show them what you bring and potentially get hired on. And that's what ended up happening. I um, was able to get, um, learned about some full-time opportunities at the beginning of this calendar year. And uh, everything worked its way through the process and I was officially hired on in March, uh, right before actually some of the hiring freezes came into effect. So I felt very fortunate there. So I'm happy to talk a little bit about what I do in that role in healthcare consulting, um, but I you know, wanna be conscious of spending you know, 10 minutes just on the first question. I know that my background kind of has taken a lot of twists and turns. So I think it's, it's worth mentioning that you can come from a lot of different spaces and think about taking those half steps closer and closer to what you learn you want to try to do next. Um, I think the biggest step for me was that pivot from the front side of healthcare to the business side. 
And I had to do a lot of intentional networking over the you know you know last year to make that transition, um, but it paid off really well for me. I'm very happy with what I'm doing right now. Yeah, thank you, Jordan. That was a great example, students too, sort of of how things shift, right? Jordan took lots of moves and pivots to get where he wanted to be, and it took just work and intentionality to get there, which I think is helpful to think about how that is. It's a it's a never ending process. It just keeps evolving, which is great. Thank you for that, Jordan. So in this in this space, we've got lots of varieties of students. We've got some that are in the college that are just thinking about consulting. Some that are be pre-med and thinking about what they might do during a bridge year. Can you just, for a basis of understanding, define what is healthcare consulting, just so we can kind of get a basis for the whole group? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think consulting at its heart is problem solving. And I could almost stop my answer there. You know, um, <laughs> I think ultimately um, people look for consultants when the problems might be either too broad, too complex, or require such specialized knowledge that, you know, an organization, a team, a company, an individual doesn't feel like they they have all of those tools to be able to solve the problem at hand. So a really good consulting, I think, is very, very focused on solving some kind of a problem. Potentially, that's making a recommendation. And I think that it merges pretty much into project management, which is often the implementation side. How do you take a recommendation and actually put it into practice? Um, and you can put any industry at the front of that word consulting, and, and that's kind of what it is. So healthcare consulting does that in the healthcare industry, IT, aerospace, what have you. Um, a lot of the basic skills are transferable, but the subject matter expertise is something that you do develop within a particular industry and you get you know, deeper and deeper into particular areas as you become more experienced, I would say. Okay, that's, that's super helpful. I think there's so many different areas of consulting to thinking about sort of what each subset might mean and thinking a little bit about how an individual student's background might start them well is, is helpful context for students that are here. So, and thinking about your liberal arts background that you had within the college being a psych major, sort of how does that liberal arts background serve you in a career like consulting, like strategy consulting? I think so. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, I had a good experience with my my classwork, and and I definitely don't feel like I needed to be um, in a different college, you know, to have the background that I did. Um, I see a variety of folks. You know, I mean, you might ask the question about, you know, do you need an MBA? Do you need that business background? And and the people I work with are a broad set. You know, I see some folks who went to PT school, physical therapy, they did that for a while, and then they were able to sort of step up a little bit and work onto the business side of things, you know, who took that route. Um, I know others who maybe did a little bit of business undergrad, but they ended up taking those first roles kind of within, you know, as analysts or something like that, and, and kind of got in that way. And so they never went back and needed to get a master's in business administration, you know, to be able to, to be competitive. So I find that it's as much about the network you have and the actual experience that you have as it is about the particular degree. Um, good consultants aren't just what they know, it's being able to convey it to people and being able to work with people. Um, and I think you can learn that in a lot of settings. For me, I learned that you know, uh, greatly through doing all that work with people and being very intentional that I was there to facilitate group dynamics, conversations, therapy, healing, you know, empowerment, all of those things, those skills translate right into the business world. That's awesome. That's super helpful. And I think that feeds into that next question a little bit about, you know, do you feel like an MBA would be necessary to be competitive in consulting? I think you sort of addressed that it's helpful for the business acumen, but you see a broad range of folks. Anything you want to add to that or does that pretty much cover the basis there? Yeah, I mean, I think think about what you feel like you need. I didn't go and get my master's right out of college. You know, mm -hmm. it was 10 years. You know, so I was a ways farther in my career and I said, this is what's going to round out my skill set personally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I considered other, other paths, but that ended up being something that was pretty broad. And that's the one thing I'll say about an MBA. I think it's a, it's a broad degree that, that gives you credibility in a lot of spaces, mm -hmm. um, but it's not the only path for sure. So like I mentioned, I think we've got a lot of students here that are thinking about or pre-med and thinking about the medical school option. So many times students consider taking a bridge year or two or three um, for medical school. Do you think healthcare would be a, a consulting would be a viable option for them in between that time? Or what's your perspective on that? 
Yeah, I definitely do. I mean, as an aside, I don't know anyone who re regrets taking a gap year or says that didn't help me grow or my career. Um, there's something about real world experience that is just a different thing than what you get in classroom learning. And you can get that through internships and other things while you're still in school too. Uh, but I do think it's really valuable to consider where can you get out and have that experience in the world, especially when you're looking at a very long um, academic path ahead of you. But to kind of answer that question, I absolutely think it's possible to do healthcare consulting. Um, you might end up, depending on your experience, being a little more entry level um, in that. But you know, the industry is really, um, I find in healthcare, really wanting for people who have the a little bit of the business experience, but also have that clinical experience because you you don't often see people who have both, and that makes you a real asset. So it's a, it's a great way to develop. That's awesome. That's super helpful. Thank you. Um, so thinking about the healthcare consulting space, you just sort of address the fact that there are people who have sometimes healthcare clinical backgrounds that have business and the combination of the two probably is really a, the strongest, but do you think there's any preference of like how that would work? Like, would it be more adept at people that have healthcare backgrounds or you don't think it's just a true balance that would exist there? I mean, I think it's, it's tough for me to speak kind of broadly because mm -hmm. so much of it is about, um, even the, down to the project level of what you're working on. You know, I'll give you an example. So um, from, you know, I have a, um, a lead on, on my team who is working on clinical documentation, which is a lot about what gets entered into the system. And she's done tons of EPIC or other electronic health record implementations. But what's interesting is her background is that she was a nurse practitioner before she came into that work. And that gives her the ability to talk to providers, you know, whether they're nurse practitioners or doctors or physician's assistants in their language, you know? So that's how she uses it because she knows the language, she knows the mindset, and that allows her to work with them really fluidly and kind of know, hey, what's going to set them off and what do they just not care about hearing? If you start talking about, you're, you lose them. So it really depends on exactly the kind of work. And and I would almost look at it as the flip side of like, look for the place where you think that you can, um, where, where you're interested, you know, the kind of work, the kind of things you like doing and learning about, and then, and then see how you can apply that. I, I think that you're going to have a lot more coherence in, in, in that way versus just trying to, you know, make an arbitrary choice because the reality is that, that both paths can lead to somewhere and it, and it comes into different spaces, you know, and I lean on my behavioral health work all the time because that's what I know, you know, that's how I can apply it. Um, other folks have a ton of experience with, you know, different aspects of project management um, or, you know, metrics, data analysis, you know, and, and they can step up in those spaces. Yeah, agreed, that's helpful. Um, and thinking about the work that you do, Jordan, like on a daily basis, what are some of the challenges that you encounter in the healthcare consulting space and how do you address those challenges? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think that, um, you know, very often one of the challenges, and I think this is really common to consulting, is that you come into a project and you're asked to be an expert and you don't know any, you don't know everything and sometimes you don't know a lot yet. So, you know, the skills of being able to be confident and comfortable in an ambiguous environment, being able to gather information, to be able to quickly synthesize that and organize it and convey it. Um, those are the kinds of things that help you kind of meet the challenges that are really common to consulting. Um, so it, again, it's that combination of analytical ability and people skills, because you're always working through people. Um, you know, the other thing I'll say is that, um, you know, for me personally, Kaiser Permanente is a really unique environment in healthcare because we have very strong labor unions and representation and the medical group is separate. So we have a lot of different stakeholder groups that are set up to kind of promote their own interests. So for me personally, in my work, one of the challenges is how do I get these different groups that work together as teams to work together to solve these larger problems and not get too stuck in their own kind of individual interests. Um, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm running a family therapy session, you know, with these different stakeholders. Um, again, that's my lens because that's the kind of background that I have. Um, but so much of it then comes back to, again, like, 
am I learning where they're coming from? Am I understanding? Am I kind of, if I can see the world through their eyes, then I'm probably able to speak to them and relate to them and help promote what's valuable to them and hook that into what we're trying to achieve together. So, you know, I think that's another challenge. And then, and then finally, like complicated problems, you know, um, and quick timelines. So you have to be kind of versatile and you have to enjoy the challenge of, of complex problems. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a question we work on in interviews a lot with students is how do you handle complex problems? That's good to hear that's applicable in the field. So in thinking about your time at UVA um, back in 08 and beyond, what are some of the skills you think has sort of served you well from your time at the university within the field of consulting or just your professional career in general? Um, you know, I think I've talked a fair amount about kind of people skills um, being really key and to detail that a little bit more um, it's becoming more talked about. So I think that this won't be a surprise to many of you, but they talk about emotional intelligence. They talk about um, being able to empathize and to validate people. And it's kind of simple and methodal in like when you, when you look at it, but it's actually, it's complicated to apply it. And so I would really encourage you to, um, you know, for me, psychology was a great foundation and then working with, in fields that were very intentional that we're doing people work, put the focus on it, you know, and I found that that gave me a lot more training ground, you know, in the business world, people don't realize that they're talking in emotional language or that they're coming from an emotional place, but it is driving them. So I would really say, you know, if, if that's not an area, if you're interested in consulting and you don't feel like you have strength in emotional intelligence, um, work on that, you know, put some time, put some, some learning, you know, find experiences that are going to allow you to promote that. Often that's what's lacking. You know, when I look at consultants who maybe didn't work out so well in a project, I think it's more that they didn't quite get how to work with people, not that they didn't know their subjects. Um, I think you can build the expertise um, in a lot of ways. And it's sometimes it's more straightforward to learn that. Um, so I would really emphasize that. You know, I think the other thing is that I really, it's not exactly a skill, but I think it's an important component is to be excited or passionate about the work. Um, obviously this isn't something that everyone gets to afford, but I'm guessing that many of you being, you know, being able to go to UVA in the first place and be college educated, you have a degree of um, freedom in your life to be able to pursue something um, that you find interesting and that you want to do. And I know for me, um, I believe healthcare is a human right and that giving healthcare better and trying to fix a pretty difficult system that we have in this country. You know, we spend way more and we get way worse outcomes than most of the rest of the developed world. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think it's really important because I believe in healthcare as a human right. That allows me to be ethically aligned in the work I'm doing, even when it seems kind of obscure. If it's towards that aim of helping an organization that I believe in, and I do because I think that they're a nonprofit. I think they're integrated. You know, a lot of those things line up for me. Um, I would really encourage you to try to find work that you can find value and meaning in because it won't be a slog. And when you do have those longer weeks, you know, I had a go live last week and I was working longer hours. You know, it doesn't feel so painful because you are doing something that you like, even if there's hard parts to it. So I think that's really important too when you think about how to grow and, and kind of what skills will serve you. You just mentioned Jordan, a go live. Can you explain to the group what that means? And just absolutely. So we can get some idea. Yeah. Yeah. So typically, um, you know, projects are broken down in these different phases and as a consultant or a project manager, you spend a lot of time planning and you do that even before you've engaged people. And as you're engaging people, there's always going to be a group that you're working with to plan and then a larger group that the project impacts. And the go live is kind of about that larger group. When do you take things and you put them into the, you know, into the real world? Like now you start working this way or now they'll talk about moving some code into production, like taking something that you've developed and putting it into the health, you know, the health record system so that that's now how you have to do the process. Um, Typically that's when the rubber meets the road. So it reveals if your planning was missing anything or if you skipped some steps or you didn't notify some stakeholders who are impacted. Um, that's a really intensive time because 
you have to be prepared to respond quickly to those. And a lot of the project's success depends on how smooth it feels for the people who it impacts. And that's kind of what a go live refers to. So in our case, I've been doing an optimization for our general surgery department for a number of months. And last week on Tuesday, um, a lot of new workflows that they were trained in were put into place and different clinical documentation went into place. We implemented a new phone system. So they had to change from what they were used to, to a new platform that allows better communication with, with patients, tracking, monitoring, quality metrics, all of those kinds of things that come with something, but it's an adjustment. And I was out in the clinics, you know, working with directly with people to understand how they were experiencing it and how we could problem solve around it. So that's, that can tend to be a busy, busy period for a consultant. I would say one more thing that I'll kind of call out is that I, I sort of touched on earlier, but there's that, I think there's a spectrum, you know, from that's very fluid in a lot of spaces between a consultant and a project manager um, or an analyst or a project coordinator. Um, you know, it, it might sound like a clean line between the problem solving and the implementing, but in practice, a lot of time those blur together. And, you know, I do as much project management work as sort of consulting and advice and problem solving. And, you know, you'll find different balances in different places, but a lot of those terms and those concepts are pretty interrelated in the, in the business world. That's helpful, Jordan. You've given us a lot of advice on networking and, and skill development. Just thinking about, there's like one piece of advice you have for students that are in the group that are thinking about a field of healthcare consulting, what would that takeaway be for them? Yeah, well, um, one of the things that I probably wished I had done even better is done the networking before I needed it. You know, I found myself, and I didn't have a bad network, so I wasn't in a terrible position, but I definitely, um, sometimes it's easy to wait until you need a position to start making connections at companies that you'd like to work at, and um, it, it's going to take longer than you want it to in that case. So I would really emphasize that if you think about the industry or where you might want to go, research some companies that you could imagine working for, you know, where there's that values alignment or interest or whatever it is that, that motivates you. And then, you know, use your network to try to find anyone who works in those places. And especially if they're in the roles that you're interested in and see if they're willing to talk to you and do like an informational interview. Um, you know, it's great when you don't have to ask for something right away, except for their time and for them to talk about their experience. Um, people are very pretty receptive to that, I find, but it takes a while because they're doing their full-time work and you're kind of an extra thing. So, you know, you might be looking for a job and you're like, oh, like it's been a week, I haven't heard from them, but for their perspective, that's nothing because they've been, you know, they're in the swing of it. So if, if I could go back and do things differently, I would probably front end the networking before I was ready to to apply for something so that I already had those contacts and companies. Um, I don't know if link, LinkedIn was really prominent when I came out of school in 2008, but I know that now that's a really powerful tool. So I would encourage you to put, I, I put, I'm not really a social media guy. I don't really love Facebook and I kind of tried to avoid a lot of those things, but LinkedIn is kind of an exception for me. I know it's, it's social, but it's, um, it's practical and it has some boundaries around it that I think make it a little bit, mm, a little safer, a little bit more palatable for me. So I would really rec recommend um, using, you know, this group to help you make your profile um, attractive and it convey what you want it to and start building that network now um, and then maintain it. You know, there are a couple of folks who I did informational interviews with at companies that didn't end up having openings, but I try to keep up with them where I can. Um, and, and those kinds of connections come back around, especially if you stay in a geographic area, which I'm guessing is becoming even less important now, but um, you know, it, it ends up being a small world and, and, and knowing people becomes more and more valuable. So that'd be, I think that's the biggest thing that I would, I would recommend, have those conversations. That's helpful, Jordan. Students, we've got an event coming up relatively soon called Who's in Your Network? It's in Handshake, where it talks all about 
how to utilize that UV alumni network to sort of take the steps that Jordan is talking about. So a very practical next step, which is great. Students, if you've got questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. I got a couple more for him, but if you have questions you wanna ask, feel free to put them in there as well and we'll, and we'll get those questions answered and addressed too. So um, Jordan, in thinking about your transition from UVA to the working world, what would you say are some challenges that you experienced? What was the hardest part for you about leaving the university and going out into the, the world of work, the real world? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I personally didn't struggle as much with that transition. Um, and maybe that's because um, I was doing stuff that I loved and I felt like it was a great fit. Um, and maybe part of that was because, you know, there was a, there was a different level of um, adulting that I had to do um, being in the outdoor industry. I didn't immediately have to go and pay rent and pay a mortgage and arrange a lot of different insurance and all of those things. I kind of lived out of my car and I got room and board when I was working in programs. So that, that kind of made some of those life challenges easier on a very practical level. But, you know, on a, on a, a work level, I would just say, you know, I think the more experience you have prior to graduating, the easier it is um, once you graduate. Um, and I think that's going to help a lot. I mean, the last thing that I would say is maybe one challenge is to, to maintain time for learning. I think you do it in a different way, um, but it's easy to shift all of your learning to like my day job is how I learn. Um, and I think it is important to like, in whatever that way that you, you learn more um, to keep maintaining that as you, as you move forward so you can continue to grow. And I think that's going to look different for everyone, um, but that's definitely an, an important piece. Awesome. The lifetime learning is important. Um, last question I've got for you. Are there any resources that you use to stay current in the field of consulting or healthcare consulting that maybe could help students as they're looking to explore and thinking about what to be reading that they could refer to as well? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll highlight a few. Um, and I imagine that these days the issue isn't finding channels, but almost like the signal to noise and trying to find the ones that are most valuable to you. Um, but LinkedIn is definitely useful. Um, you know, continuing to use that network. Um, you know, you can get on, I, I'm on the listserv for various consulting firms and they send out, you know, thought pieces and things like that on a regular basis because they want to sort of show to people who are receiving it, hey, you know, these are, these are the kinds of things we're working on. Don't you want us to come and work for you? Um, so if you can get on those kinds of lists, that's pretty useful. Um, you know, talking to colleagues in the field, um, if you have opportunities to, to connect with, you know, folks outside of your particular project team or your particular lane, if you do very interdisciplinary work, I think you can learn a ton that way. Um, there have been times where I've, you know, there are often um, consulting networks, you know, that can be a resource like um, in different geographic areas, you know, there's one in Denver and I'd use that for networking and, and other things like that. You know, I imagine that there's a lot of like blogs and association letters that you can get on to. I personally haven't, you know, spent a lot of time in that space. Um, and lastly, you know, just kind of a general plug about um, newsletters and all of those things. I, I think that um, it is important to stay up on the news and sort of current events and current events in your, your field. Um, I also think it's really important to be conscious of what media you're intaking. Um, and particularly now, and, and, and I think it's easy to kind of get um, sucked in. So definitely think about sort of how do you integrate it into your daily routine or your weekly routine? What are the sources that, you know, provide you with real information without just making you kind of feel worse? And, 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 and focus on those. Um, there's a lot of good channels. Um, you know, I definitely, I, I read the New York Times, you know, here and there when I can. There's another newsletter called Axios that I think is very brief. I would recommend looking at that. It's still free, um, even though they've really upped the quality and the content that they deliver. Uh, I think that's AXIOS. Um, and they have a lot of specific ones. You know, they have science or healthcare. You know, you can subscribe to sort of different letters. And um, they're all about smart brevity. So you're never going to find an email that's more than a five or seven minute read. And, and it's pretty bullet point focused. So I think, you know, just this, there's a lot of channels out there, but it's ultimately going to be up to you to figure out what, what really gives you a lot of information, you know, high value to low, low time investment, you know, ratio, I guess.
Awesome. We've got some good questions that are coming in from students. So, oh, how would may I, may I add one more thing? Please um, go. Definitely out in like you know as a professional, I do try to stay on like um, you know university listservs. Like the University of Denver has a university college where they do a lot of online or or sort of uh, additional learning. So I've gone back and taken short courses on various topics that are interesting to me, whether that's like leadership development or change management, you know, so those can be useful too once you're, you're out of full-time class, but to remind you, oh yeah, like I like school. I can, I can do this on a shorter basis and it's a different feel because it's a lot of adult learning. So yeah, that's a great yeah. point. Thank you for having with your so, question. Yeah. So we got one that came in here. How does healthcare consulting differ between private firms like Kaiser on the government side? And what types of projects do you typically work on at an organization like Kaiser? Okay. So the first part of the question was how does it differ from what were the two point, the two comparisons? From private firms like Kaiser and the more government side. Yeah. I, I will, I will admit that I don't have a great sense of, what the government side is, um, you know, certainly within healthcare. Um, and I think every organization is going to be pretty different. So, you know, at, for example, at Kaiser, um, there really is an explicit focus on member quality, um, cost, and, um, and I think that, you know, the problems we work on are sort of not like, how do we be cutthroat with our competitors, but more like, you know, we have a system with a lot of different stakeholders and, and things like that. And I've heard working at, you know, other maybe industries that are or maybe companies that are more profit driven, you might have a greater sort of that classic business mentality, if you will, of uh, being a little bit more driven and a little bit more sort of laser focused results driven in the same way. Um, but a lot of that is part and parcel with sort of how it feels to work there. I think Kaiser is really good to its employees um which is a great bonus you know you're very well taken care of and so you have really a lot of long-term people there you know in the government space um again i don't have a ton of experience but from what i hear things move pretty slowly that's one feature private world can move faster um and i think there's a lot of hoops and red tape to jump through um especially as you get into those more regulated field you know like defense contract contracting and um, you know uh, th things like that uh, it can it can be a little bit more drawn out and I would also add that there's a lot of work in the IT space that crosses industries um, and that tends to be a bit more analytical and a bit more detail focused um, you know if you like that it's it's it can often be pretty broad to you know IT um, in one space you can often develop some expertise and skills that apply to other industries even. So I think there was a second part of the question and I yeah, want to make sure that I captured it. For sure. It was what types of projects do you typically work on at Kaiser? Yeah. So I, I am in the care delivery optimization space or bucket. Um, our transformation office is divided up. Some additional buckets are um, like uh, general efficiencies, pharmacy, um, Medicaid risk adjustment. Um, we've got um, some other projects that are specific to certain member groups, you know, but like a special setup for the state of Colorado because they're a very large member group. The projects that I've worked on have really been um, pretty focused on operations or spaces that touch operations. I did a very large project um, last year, which was our primary care optimization. And we really redesigned a lot of primary care across the 30, 30 or so clinics that we have in the Colorado region. And I actually was just a work stream lead. So I was specifically focused on scheduling. And that meant that I learned a lot about the schedule templates that people book into, the programs that do that booking, the visit types. There's a lot of technical backend systems that have to work to support what operations is trying to do. And at the same time, we were trying to optimize a model and we were changing all of that. So I worked from sort of all the way from the IT technical side up to the senior leader side of helping to bridge that connect, that, 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 um, that gap of sort of like, we want to do this, but it's limited by the tools we have. And how do you help those two groups understand each other and achieve goals? Um, I did another interesting project in care delivery where um, there is a, there's a, a vaccine for shingles. There have actually been a couple of those 
um, and there's a new vaccine called Shingrix, which is a little bit more effective than the old vaccine. The manufacturer decided to advertise heavily before they had production up to a level that they could sustain. And so they actually created a shortage and very high demand across the country and not enough supply. And it's an expensive vaccine. This created some issues in an organization that has trouble with siloing where different groups are doing independent things. And we sort of had a really backward system for distributing the vaccine where we would sort of guess how many members would go to particular clinics, create certain appointment templates that match that, and then hope that they would book into those and not really manage our supply, um, not really optimize our supply. So we had a shortage, but we also weren't distributing efficiently. And um, my work stream, the scheduling work stream, broke their makeshift project process because we said we're not doing these kinds of templates anymore based on the, the new staffing model. And okay, so now what do we do? We broke something that was in place and it was kind of a duct tape solution. How do we fix that? And so what I ended up doing is, you know, I, I gathered a lot of information about um, the different groups that touch this. So there was pharmacy, there was population health, there was the operations side, there was a lot of IT that was required to have a more fluid system. Um, for how you would manage this. They had created a huge wait list, thousands of members that were on the wait list for wanting this vaccine. And I actually uh, learned all that. And then one night I just sketched out a new process on paper. I actually diagrammed it. It was like a flow chart. And I said, this is the efficient way to design this process where you have, where you're optimizing your supply and, and you do it in sort of a top down way um, where you, you know, you book appointments and then you push the vaccine based on those appointments. And it means we book a month out, but that allows us to actually use all the supply we have. And this is how we're going to contact members who are on the wait list. And I worked with IT and everyone to say, how do we work these wait lists? How do we get messaging out? What's our contact strategy? I worked with the call center. You know, we can't, they don't, you know, they don't do outbound calls. So how do we problem solve that? Well, we, we send a message to their phone and if they call back, we have this thing flag on their chart that says they were on the wait list and they were contacted. So we create all of these systems to support a solution that's streamlined. And then I had to get all the groups to work together to implement it. And I, and I did that, I worked with everyone. Luckily I had backing from administration to support it. And eventually, you know, they named an operational lead and I got her up to speed and worked together and kind of coached her and then said, okay, it's time, I'm out. You contact me if you still have questions and I moved on to another project, and then they continued to work that. Um, so that was kind of an interesting one. And that was a smaller project, but um, I think it's a good example to give of how there's a lot of different pieces that kind of go into the pie. Um, and then, like I said, right now, I've been working on a general surgery optimization project. Um, we had an emergency operations command center, we still do to respond to coronavirus. When my project was put on pause, um, after some shuffle, I actually got put on a temporary project where we said, how can we help with hospital surge capacity? Well, we don't own hospitals in Colorado, but what do we own? We have these outpatient surgery centers. Could we convert those surgery centers to be like hospital wings and offload some patients to prepare for this surge of patients that you all have heard about in the news that we anticipated and, um, and whatnot? And so we had a couple of intensive works, weeks of work where I was working with everyone from IT to surgical, surgical leaders and, and whatnot. And we designed a plan that we could submit to the state and say, hey, can you give us a waiver to allow us to convert one of our surgery centers to be sort of a hospital wing? And, um, and then we had another one where we said, how can we do operations 24 hours a day instead of just being a day center? How do we staff for that? What are all the components? Um, and that was actually like a, a two week sprint. And by the time we had gotten the plan ready, it turned out we didn't need to implement it because in Colorado, we managed to actually keep the surge to levels that didn't overwhelm our hospital system. So there's a great example of being flexible. You know, one week I was on one project, the next week I was on this. I learned a whole bunch about surgery and got to know all the stakeholders and help them. And then, okay, great, we're moving on. We'll keep a pin in that but we don't need it right now. So those are some examples of the projects I've worked on in the last year. And I had some other projects, you know, back at Aurora Mental Health Center that were similarly interdisciplinary. The garden project, I did one about transportation. How do we get clients into our offices? What are our different options to make it easier for them? Um, 
So it can really be a pretty wide variety. Uh, two really good questions in here, Jordan. One of them is focused on sort of the search process and like how to discover entry level positions. And as it relates to like the timeline, is there any sort of cycle to how healthcare consulting hires? Well, that's a good question. And I don't know of a cycle that I've been really clear on. Um, sometimes people talk about fiscal cycles mattering. I think that right now, all of that's out the window because we're in a really unique space with the pandemic and that hits healthcare pretty hard. Some companies maybe have a little bit of an edge and others are hitting, being hit financially pretty significantly by this. So it's a weird time for hiring. Um, that said, you know, so I've heard things like, okay, well in October they're putting together their next year's budgets, but I don't know. I think that's pretty company specific. As far as kind of how you might work your way in though, I think a lot of entry level positions will have words like analyst or coordinator or maybe even intern. And um, those can typically be a little bit less senior um, than sort of project manager um, or senior analyst or consultant or those kinds of things as you work your way up. Um, so I would keep an eye out for those types of, of postings. Um, Truthfully, it's much more dependent on your network than it is hitting some kind of hiring cycle because every company's hiring cycle is a little different. You know, in my case, they had actually laid off a ton of people right before I started because they were in a huge financial crisis and they started with the leaders and they worked their way down. You know, they started with the back end, not the, not the patient facing side. They didn't do layoffs there, you know, at the beginning. They said, how can we trim our business side. So it's kind of odd that there was space, but the transformation office had opened up. And to sort of mitigate that hiring thing, they said, well, we'll hire consultants because we don't have to, we can let them go anytime. So there was a risk to that. But I think if you're willing to take a risk and come in as a consultant, um, that's your chance to prove yourself. And it worked out well for me. So I would always look for those, you know, part-time, um, limited, you know, contract opportunities. Those are good opportunities to get in. Whatever you can do that lets you show them what you bring, um, that's your foot in the door. Well, this is a great one. It's a great question. So it starts off with thank you for an insightful session. Um, question is, during your time at Kaiser as a strategy analyst and otherwise, have you had an opportunity to work on international health projects or is the focus of operations more within the U.S.? The focus has been more in the U.S., um, Kaiser Permanente pretty much operates domestically and, um, you know, what limited sort of international public health work they do, there's probably just a few individuals who work on maybe some interdisciplinary or interorganizational task forces. Um, I would say if you were to get into the, you know, maybe in the research space, um, there would be a little bit more of looking at other parts of the world. Um, I would say in healthcare, I wish it were more international, but the U.S. is kind of a, a very weird, unique space. Not a lot of countries do it like we do, um, where you, you know, to editorialize, we, we kind of let special interests run away with things, and it's pretty hard to dig out from that. So, you know, there's really entrenched groups um, within healthcare that have a lot of power, and that kind of keeps sometimes things feel stuck and broken. Um, but sorry to say that, no, I haven't had a lot of international work. Um, I have in other spaces where I've been able to do some cool, you know, projects, but um, y not so much through Kaiser. Thank you. Well, Jordan, as we wrap up, any last pieces of advice that you'd like to share with these students that are thinking about healthcare consulting that you can think of? You know, I think by and large, the, the people who work in the field, you know, on the front lines are, are helpers and healers, you know, and, and I like that. That's been a, that's been a space that I, that I enjoy because I can relate to that. I've always been someone who really, you know, for me, my sort of worldview and value lens is you take the skills that you bring and you apply them to serve humanity. And that's kind of lofty and, 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 and grand, but I think you can do that at a very 
practical and concrete level. Um, I think that you'll find the most happiness and alignment in your in your work if you you see the connection to doing something that makes the world a better place and you are picking areas where your unique skills apply. And there's lots of ways to know what those are, um, you know, from friends, from personality tests, from the classes that you chose to take. Um, but, but thinking and talking to people about how you can apply those, I think is gonna help you have a career that's fulfilling. And the other piece of advice I would give is that um, I don't know where everyone's from. Um, I grew up in Northern Virginia, and I think a lot of folks who go to UVA are kind of from the East Coast world. And I would just say that my personal perception is that there's a very track-minded mentality that's very common in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, I talked about this at the very beginning of sort of like, this is my 10-year plan. Um, and I would encourage you to know that that's not the mentality that the rest of the country has or the rest of the world. And there are a lot of different ways to approach life. And so I would, you know, if you feel like that's a, that's something that causes you stress or you're, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge to sort of know, or you, you feel uncertainty, it's okay to be uncertain. And I can attest to the fact that I had no idea where I was going to go. And I didn't even know what consulting was when I left UVA. And here I am, and I'm very happy with the work that I've done. Um, you know, there are lots of different ways to approach life. And I think that that kind of very thoroughly planned one is one approach. And there are a lot of other ways of, of learning um, from each other and from the experiences you have. So I think don't let yourself get too attached or caught up to any one particular ideal that you have in your mind and do allow experience to guide you. Um, but in that experience, make sure that you pay attention to what in the work do you like doing and what do you not like doing and try to learn how do you take that one step farther towards what you like doing. I love that. That's a great way to, to sort of end things off. That was a great piece of advice. Well, Jordan, thank you so much for taking your time to be here and share your experience with students. Students, thank you all so much for being here too. Hope this was helpful. And there'll be a follow-up email, which is additional details about consulting moving forward. But again, thanks everyone for being here. And Jordan, hope you have a great weekend, long weekend ahead of you. Thanks. I'm really looking forward to being out in Colorado. That's why I moved here after all, to get outside. So it's it. been a pleasure. I wish you all the best and thanks so much. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye, everybody. Bye. And you can hang if you want, Jordan. You're welcome to, to pop out, too. But it was great to see you. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Yeah, I wasn't sure if there was any, you know, any debrief or anything else. No, unless you want to, that was great.